acupuncture and clinical care. Welcome. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And Steve and I are both very excited to talk about medical acupuncture and clinical practice. We are both trained as primary care physicians, but we've, as Bob has said, has expanded to uh, training in medical acupuncture. Uh, this is a program that is offered twice a year by Dr. Joseph Helms, who is a family practitioner and a pain management specialist in California and in Maryland. So we're lucky that it's actually offered once a year in Potomac, Maryland. Um, we get on um, live training as well as um, practice in between uh, in between sessions, and, and this this is resulting in certification by State of Maryland to practice medical acupuncture within the scope of our specialties. So Dr. Helms and the other um, person here is Dr. Nielsen, who has contributed to this research today. She's a PhD and licensed acupuncturist at Beth Israel Medical Center in the Department of Integrative Medicine in New York. Dr. Helms is the director of the Medical Acupuncture for Physicians course and is the founder of the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture and has been involved in getting board certification for medical acupuncture, which has been in place since 2000. So our objectives today are to cover historical and current definitions for acupuncture, to review the theoretical mechanisms of acupuncture, both from traditional Chinese medicine and Western biomedical perspectives, and to delineate how acupuncture is best used in clinical practice. We'll go over benefits and risks, as well as re relative contraindications to acupuncture, as well as the clinical evidence based on randomized controlled trials on various clinical conditions, and we'll discuss what the evidence base is for acupuncture as well. So the Latin Jesuits in the 17th century brought over acupuncture from China to Europe, and they named it acupuncture for acus meaning needle and punctura meaning puncture. It is the most commonly performed medical procedure worldwide. Millions have been treated over about a 2,000 year period, started in about 200 BC in China um, it has evolved to a modern both art and science of, of, med of medicine. Um, it is considered an essential element of traditional Chinese medicine, the other components being herbal therapy, uh, moxibustion, which is um, also related to herbal therapy, massage, exercises, and dietary therapy. The National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which is associated with the NIH, does define met, um, acupuncture as a procedure involving stimulation of anatomical points, which are called acupuncture points on the body. There are over 400 acupuncture points, as well as extra points. The, the acupuncture point uh, treatment involves penetrating the skin with thin, solid metallic needles. They're about one to two human hairs in diameter, and they're manipulated manually, either by hands or by electrical stimulation. See all the pictures there. We talked a little bit about training. There's two basic categories of acupuncture training and licensure in the United States. There's about 16,000 licensed acupuncturists, so this is a graduate, resulting in a graduate degree and master's of acupuncture or a doctor of acupuncture or a doctor of, of oriental medicine. Um, they do get an anatomic tr anatomy training and some training in Western medicine, as well as a strong focus in Eastern medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. Um, physician training programs um, result in certification at the state level, and you have to be an MD or DO uh, to get that. Um, so there's 16,000 licensed acupuncturists and 6,000 physicians who practice acupuncture either as a solo practice or in conjunction with their, with their specialty practice. Um, licensure requirements do vary from state to state. And there are also different styles of practice. There's traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM. There's Japanese-style acupuncture. There's auricular acupuncture, which focuses solely on ear needles. And there's Western biomedical acupuncture, which um, focuses more on anatomy and physiology uh, mechanisms of acupuncture and uses that to treat patients. 
These are some examples of both ancient and modern acupuncture needles. So the first needles were made of bone in 200 BC. These are from the uh, Traditional Chinese Medicine Museum in Shanghai, China. Stainless steel needles today are all single-use disposable um, for the last 15, 20 years. These are made in out of, outside of a factory in Boston, and they're sterilized with eth ethylene oxide. Um, so these, once they're used, are just uh, disposed of in the sharps container, just like any other procedure would be. So now we're going to talk about how ac acupuncture works, and I'll talk a little bit about the theory behind acupuncture from a traditional Chinese medicine point of view, and then Steve will talk about the Western biomedical theories. The theory of qi, uh, qi or qi, uh, is um, loosely translated as life energy, which permeates all living things. The goal of acupuncture is to balance qi, to make the flow of energy in the body smooth and unobstructed. So disease is thought to occur from an imbalance of what's called yin and yang, yin and yang being very general, loose, uh, loosely translated means um, opposite but interdependent forces of the universe. And this could be things like light and shadow, hot and cold, fire and water, sky and, er sky and earth. Um, an imbalance between yin and yang lead to an imbalance of this life energy or qi, whereas the balance of yin and yang lead to a balance of qi and therefore health. So acupuncture is believed to, again, balance yin and yang, keep the flow of qi smooth, and restore health to the body and mind. So all traditional Chinese medicine practices are intended to improve the flow of qi. It's important to know that the philosophy of Chinese medicine involves self-healing as opposed to the allopathic medicine um, usual way of thinking, which is to provide an external uh, source such as a drug or surgery. In traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, it is thought that by stimulating the, own, the body's own capacity for healing, this is, how, uh, this is how treatment of illness and promotion of health occurs. So qi runs through energy pathways called meridians. Um, these run along the body surface, uh, both um, between the surface of the body and between the surface and the internal organs. There are, 12, there are 12 classic meridians and eight extra meridians for a total of 20 meridians. And along those meridians, acupuncture points are um, occur, which are thought to be at highly concentrated areas of energy. And Steve will talk a little bit more about the research um, that, is, that is verifying this. These are examples of some of the meridians named for the organs through which they run. So do meridians really exist? Um, that's an area of controversy, obviously. And meridians do not course directly correspond to nerve or blood circulation pathways. Some researchers, um, notably Helene Langevin at University of Vermont, have done a lot of basic science research on uh, meridian theory and believe that meridians are located throughout the body's connective tissue or fascia. So if we postulate that fascia is not only a local enveloping of tendons, uh, muscles and bones, but in fact a more spread throughout the body so there's communication between fascia and the legs and fascia and the torso, um, that, may, that may be why acupuncture in one area of the body distally to a point to an area that you're treating actually works. So in the journey from uh, east to west, uh, acupuncture started coming over to Europe in the 17th century with French Jesuits who named it acupuncture. Um, in the 19th century, as immigrants came over to the United States, they brought their customs of acupuncture, but was generally confined to Chinatowns. In 1890, William Osler, in his book, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, did comment on a case study done by a local acupuncturist at the time of low back pain and how that was helpful for acupuncture. Uh, Dr. Osler is in the picture there. But in 1971 was really when acupuncture took off in America. A journalist named um, James Reston went over to Beijing, China, and had an emergency appendectomy at that time. Post-operatively, he did have a lot of pain, and they treated him only with acupuncture. And he had some remar remarkable pain relief from that. So he then, you know, when he flew back to the United States, actually wrote an article in the New York Times and got a lot of doctors interested. They started going over to China and touring Beijing and the rest of China for sort of, you know, how does acupuncture really work? What, it, what is to this, you know? Um, the first school of licensed acupuncture opened in Boston in new, uh, 1975, and that is still, still here today. 
1983, Dr. Joseph Helms at UCLA started the medical acupuncture course for physicians, which again is still um, happening twice a year. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about Westerners uh, have discovered about acupuncture. And, uh, certainly, uh, no one's hit a home run yet, but there's a lot of information that's uh, of what's happening in the body. It's not necessarily always Okay. Um, uh, and, and the research into acupuncture from a so-called Western approach um, started in the 40s and 50s, uh, looking basically at uh, human anatomy. As we learn more about neurotransmitters and discovered uh, endogenous opioids, research shifted in that direction. Uh, and then after the uh, creation of functional MRIs, research shifted in that direction. So what early research researchers found was that they took what's called a galvanomer um, and uh, looked at the uh, electrical charge on the skin. Uh, we're living beings, we're not dead. We have uh, electrolytes running through our body and nerve pathways and energy in our body. Um, and they looked at the electrical resistance of the skin and, and mapped out areas where there's low impedance um, and found that those areas actually corresponded to acupuncture points on the body. Um, then they did research where they stuck needles in those points and saw if they could, uh, if there's a, a current that can be measured between the two needles. And what they found was, generally speaking, uh, at acupuncture points, there was a measurable current that fl that flowed from one needle to the next. Uh, but when they when they went outside traditional acupuncture points or areas that didn't have low impedance, there wasn't this development of a current. Uh, the pathologists took a uh, stab at this as well, um, and what they, what the, what's been discovered is that a lot of the acupoints, as uh, Andy uh, referred to before, um, occur along uh, cleavage planes and muscles. And when they've looked at what's going on there under slides, they found that there's actually, or under acupuncture points, they found that there is uh, a unique uh, anatomy to those areas. Again, it's not every acupuncture point, but it's a, a large. Uh, uh, predominance of them. They found that there's nerve artery, uh, nerve bundles and arteries and lymph vessels that sort of wind up and collect in that area. Um, and this occurs in a column in connective tissue. You can kind of see that in the picture there some. Now acupuncture, when we get into neurotransmitters, uh, gets a little more interesting because they found that uh, either what we call dry needling, which is just needling uh, of itself alone, or needling when you attach electrodes to needles results in, um, <coughs> it affects the body's uh, neurotransmitters, um, both serotonin, norepinephrine, and endogenous opioids. And this, uh, this gets into the theory of pain. What, what, what research supports is that acupuncture can um, treat pain both locally and uh, in area. So lo by locally, I mean if you put the needles in a certain area where it hurts, you can reduce pain in that area. But it's also been noted that if you, say, do it on your foot, you could get pain relief on your shoulder. And that's hard for Westerners uh, to swallow. But there is some theory behind it that's um, supportive of how that might work. I'll talk very briefly about uh, pain and acupuncture and pain perception. Um, as you all probably know, when we hurt somewhere, let's say in our finger, a nerve impulse goes um, up to the spinal cord, from the spinal cord up to the brain stem, and then up to the brain. Acupuncture is thought to mediate a local um, pain relieving effect by, let's say your knee hurts, if you stick needles in the, in the uh, dermatome uh, about the knee, you'll send impulses up to the spinal cord where pain signals are modulated um, and affect pain perception that way and reduce pain perception. 
Um, but those signals go up the spinal cord into the brain where there's lots of synapses taking place and your body um, perceives pain. So you have the, the pain signal and the pain signal goes to the brain where the body says, oh, something hurts. And then there's an affective component to pain perception, which is it hurts and I don't like it. Um, and the, the affective component um, is very individualized. And um, you could imagine a cancer patient may have a strong affective response to pain because it may mean disease progression versus a young athlete who just kind of bumped their knee and says, ah, oh, I have pain, no big deal. So the affective response to pain is important. And we'll talk about how acupuncture may affect that. But the idea about acupuncture affecting distal pain relief is that when the signal that comes from the periphery gets up to the brain where pain is perceived, acupuncture can modulate what happens in the area of the brain where pain is perceived. Comedy break. <laughs> um, so what is what has research found with this? Well, using electroacupuncture, that means uh, stimulating the needles put into the body. They found that uh, with with low frequency stimulation, you can stimulate the release of endogenous opioids, and this analgesic effect is blockable with naloxone. This research was done uh, mostly in dental surgery. Um, when you use higher frequency uh, stimulation, um, that cannot be blocked by um, naloxone. And the theories support that that's because that uh, pain stimulus, pain blocking stimulus is mediated through norepinephrine and serotonin, which is in experimental um, research blockable by serotonin and norepinephrine blockers, but not naloxone. And what's interesting to note is that even to this day, although it, it's never been very common, um, in, in China acupuncture is used as the sole analgesic in surgery. Um, that could be head and neck surgery, dental surgery, some abdominal surgeries, but usually for the big, big surgeries, opening up the abdomen, it's not used in stuff like that. Um, so now we'll talk about functional MRIs, which is the latest uh, area of research. Um, basically what they do is they stick needles into people and see what happens in the brain and then alter what they're doing to people and see how things change. Functional MRIs, for those who aren't as familiar, um, are taking pictures of the brain in real time and seeing what happens to the brain when it's stimulated. So what acupuncture research has shown is that um, in terms of pain, uh, performing acupuncture may deactivate pain perception areas. And they see that pain perception areas in the brain light up and are affected when, when acupuncture occurs. And I mentioned before about the emotional response to pain. Ac acupuncture um, affects the parts of the brain that are involved in the, the affective response to pain. In terms of meridian pathways, uh, some studies have shown similar patterns in the MRI based on, on which meridian you're using. So if you're using a meridian on the arm, several, um, well, the studies looked at two points on several meridians and found that those two points on the same meridian affect the brain in a similar way. So a meridian on the arm may affect the brain in a similar way. A meridian on the leg may affect the brain in a similar way. They've also looked at uh, acupuncture uh, versus placebo in terms of analgesia, because there's a lot of legitimate concern that acupuncture may just be a placebo effect. So they looked at two groups, those that got acupuncture for experimentally induced pain and those that um, didn't get acupuncture for experimentally induced pain and had some other uh, intervention that they thought may reduce pain. And what they found was that um, Similar groups had similar pain reduction um, experiences, but the, the areas of pain perception that lit up in the brain were different, which suggested that the placebo pain relief was through a different mechanism in the body than the analgesia from acupuncture. They also looked at uh, healthy patients, uh, healthy people, and uh, patients who are ill. 
and noted different acupuncture stimulation patterns in the brain among those two groups. And all this research is not definitive, but it is interesting. Um, there's also a lot of problems with functional MRI studies as well. Um, a lot of studies are incons show inconsistent results. Um, same, same points stimulating different parts of the brain in different people. Um, jam affecting the brain, sim not real acupuncture, doing similar things to real acupuncture, or just a lot of overlap, real acupuncture giving different results at different times. Um, other effects of acupuncture beyond pain, that's measurable. Um, vasodilation, increased blood flow is often, uh, often occurs, and this is an example of someone's back with some needles in. It's not a great picture, but you see it all the time in clinical practice that the area around the needle insertion gets uh, r red, blanches, and then goes away. So how is medical acupuncture best utilized in clinical practice? Again, a picture of the meridians here. And a patient getting acupuncture treatment. So finding a qualified practitioner can sometimes be difficult, but this cartoon was written in Arizona. So. And um, there's, there's two big websites that you can go to to find a qualified practitioner for medical acupuncturists, medicalacupuncture.org. And the American Association of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine has a website, uh, AAAOMonline.com.org. So. Insurance cover of that coverage of acupuncture is variable, but many private insurers do cover acupuncture for specific conditions for which the evidence is fairly robust, including back pain, headache, neck pain, osteoarthritis, uh, post-operative pain, and dental uh, pain post-dental surgery. Um, Medicare and Medicaid do not cover acupuncture at this time, not surprisingly. Medical acupuncture in clinical practice uh, is acupuncture performed by a doctor trained in Western medicine that also practices acupuncture. You may use either a Chinese or Western approach to acupuncture or a combination as the need arises. I would also add that um, if you practice both acupuncture and Western medicine, there is a distinction between them, but there's also some overlap in terms of clinical care so that if, if I see a patient for acupuncture, I may first evaluate them from a Western perspective, which is typically what I always do. How is acupuncture best utilized for each individual patient? There's four factors to consider, at least. One is the patient's medical condition and general condition of health and how they would tolerate a potential treatment. Number two is the patient's treatment goals and what they view as possible effective treatment. Number three are possible risks, benefits, and relative contraindications to acupuncture. And number four is reviewing the evidence base for treatment, which is constantly evolving. The potential benefits of acupuncture involve not just treatment of various medical illnesses, but also prevention of illness and promotion of health and well-being. So many patients go to acupuncture for health maintenance and for prevention of illness. Side effects of acupuncture, which we'll get into at the next slide, but just very generally, is, is very safe in the hands of qualified practitioners. Uncommon side effects include dizziness, syncope, nausea, headache, local pain, and minor bleeding or hematoma. Infection and pneumothorax are very rare, but have been reported in the medical literature. Relative contraindications for acupuncture include pregnancy to avoid certain points, especially in the fetal area, and other points that could stimulate labor if that was unwanted. Also, bleeding disorders or if they're on anticoagulation, which may include Coumadin or Plavix. I think Plavix being the, the briskest of those. Pacemaker. Um, Having someone with a pacemaker, you would want to avoid electrical stimulation, but manual acupuncture should be fine. And then the presence of infection can also be a relative contraindication, and I think when, with a systemic infection, an absolute contraindication. If <clears throat> the safety of physician acupuncture was comprehensively evaluated in the JRAC or German acupuncture study in 2009, we did contact Dr. Wett and, um, to get more details about this study. It was a prospective observational study over five years that ended in 2004 that studied 
13,000, uh, over 13,000 physicians in Germany that practice medical acupuncture on a total of over 200,000 patients in the outpatient setting for common clinical conditions such as headache, osteoarthritis, back pain, but also other things like allergic rhinitis and asthma. The analysis of the safety of acupuncture in this population was based on a total of 2.2 million acupuncture treatments. The adverse event rate was only 2.2% that required further treatment, which was defined as things like self-treatment by the patient, so they might take Tylenol for pain, or by further treatment, uh, including a follow-up visit with the physician, and mostly was minor bleeding, which was 57% of that 2.2%, um, minor pain, nausea, and dizziness in that order. Serious adverse events were extremely rare. Local infection was one in 71,000 treatments, and systemic infection was only five cases. Pneumothorax, there were two cases, one of which had to go to the ICU, uh, but again, only one in 1.1 million treatments resulted in pneumothorax. And there were no deaths or permanent injuries from these 2.2 million acupuncture treatments. Uh, for the next part, we will talk about challenges in uh, acupuncture. <clears throat> so it's, it's very hard to do what you might consider pristine research. It's hard to get rid of bias in acupuncture research, and I'll talk briefly about why that is and what people, uh, what people do to try to get around it. Um, one method of ac acupuncture research is acupuncture versus what's defined as placebo acupuncture. So I put the picture up here. You can see that there's a needle attached to a, a little yellow plastic thing. Um, that's not a real acupuncture situation. What happens is the acupuncturist pushes the needle down and the, the needle slides down. Some of the models, it pokes the skin but doesn't pierce the skin, so the patient feels something, uh, but nothing goes actually into the skin. Um, obviously, you can't blind an acupuncturist to this, um, but it's the closest we can get to acupuncture placebo. Basically, this helps tease out whether acupuncture has an effect beyond that of the placebo effect, meaning the environment in which the patient's getting the acupuncture and the acupuncture itself. Another common uh, type of acupuncture research is what's called sham. Uh, so it's acupuncture versus a sham control. So one, one group of patients gets real acupuncture, and the sham control group may get very shallow acupuncture meaning the needle just barely put into the skin and, and at not uh, traditional acupuncture point sites. Um, which is good in a sense, um, but also some of the basic problems with that is, since what I've described before, you stick the needles in the body and things happen, um, it could be true that sticking the needles anywhere in the body causes things to happen. Um, so you may be getting a true effect from sticking the needles, even though we call it sham. Other types of research um, have their obvious pitfalls. Uh, acupuncture versus accepted therapy. A recent example of that is acupuncture versus venlafaxine for hot flashes uh, induced, by, induced by a breast cancer therapy. They found that acupuncture was equivalent. Um, but again, there is no control acupuncture group. Another typical type of research is acupuncture versus, uh, or added on to accepted therapy. So two, cr two groups of patients getting uh, physical therapy for osteoarthritis of the knee. One of them gets uh, acupuncture, the other one gets nothing, just routine care. And you compare those two. Obviously, lots of pitfalls there. And one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks for acupuncture is that what happens in reality in the real world setting is that every patient's treated different. A patient who comes in with knee pain or stomach ulcer, when you talk to them, you're going to, when you think about needling them, you're, look, you're thinking about, you know, who's this person? Are they an anxious person? Are they a depressed person? Are they a fatigued person? How can I rev them up or calm them down beyond just what's going on in the knee pain? So every patient's really treated differently. And so it, you obviously can't randomize a study comparing <laughs> patients that you're all treating differently. And that's, you know, that's just sort of a philosophical problem. Um, to get controlled trials where we're doing the same thing to every patient, it's not the way acupuncture is 
practiced, but it's sort of what we're forced to do to um, get pristine randomized controlled trials. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the evidence for palliative care. Um, just very briefly, palliative care is essentially focused on suffering, pain, and symptom management, often in, pa often in patients who are quite ill, but not necessarily always the case. Um, I see patients shortness of breath from heart failure to cancer pain, etc. Unlike hospice, uh, palliative care is not focused solely on end of life like uh, hospice care is. So I, I might see a patient at any stage of disease, even hoping for cure. Um, so what I'll talk about now, there's a lot of overlap with uh, primary care. And I used Cochrane sort of as the go-to for um, for a meta-analysis of the literature because Cochrane uh, tends to be pretty conservative. If they're willing to say something is effective, then there's a good chance that it is. <laughs> um, so for, for, this was 10 years ago, they looked at the literature for acute back pain, uh, uncertain if it helped. For chronic, um, they showed that acupuncture was, they concluded that acupuncture was better than sham for both uh, pain management and functional improvement. Um, not better than conventional treatment, but might be nice for a patient to avoid taking an NSAID if they're elderly. Yeah? Yeah. Right. That's a good question and, and um, another area of problems with research because there's so many different ways to treat osteoarthritis of the knee with acupuncture. Um, so what you're asking is dose, acupuncture dose, you might call it. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I'd say a typical treatment for a, a chronic problem might be once or twice a week for three months um, with maintenance visits uh, several, you know, every two or three months. Again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary based on what you're treating and the patient's response to it. And your treatments might change over time based on what's happening with the patient. Um, so for hip and osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, this was uh, Cochrane from 2007. Let's say a little, uh, some support for that it may lead to small improvements at eight and, and 26 weeks. Uh, for shoulder pain, 2003 again, uh, in insufficient evidence. Um, just a few months ago in the Archives of Internal, of Internal Medicine, a very large meta-analysis was published um, looking at uh, the most recent literature and the older literature and uh, basically concluded that for the, the problems listed, uh, acupuncture was superior to sham and placebo acupuncture and usual care. Some of the studies, there was, you know, a pretty good difference. Some, it, you might say, it was statistically significant, but maybe not so clinically significant. Um, but nonetheless, there is support. For cancer pain, um, not a lot of evidence. Uh, Cochrane said insufficient evidence. There was one high quality one which showed superiority of acupuncture over sham acupuncture. Again, that's using, sticking needles in people, but in the wrong places, so to speak, versus real acupuncture. Um, pain from aromatase inhibitors in cancer therapy, acupuncture was shown to help significantly. For chemotherapy-induced nausea, um, Cochrane came out in support of that for acute vom actually for acute vomiting, not for nausea. They didn't measure nausea in the studies. Um, that was in 2006. There was, there's been further research since then, JAMA in 2010. Um, there was a randomized controlled trial and showed that uh, acupuncture was superior for vomiting while patients were actually getting chemotherapy. Um, I'll skip, skip the next one. It's a retrospective study. Of course, it was positive. <laughs> um, and this, I, I, I don't know what to make of this, but it's very interesting that for chemotherapy-induced uh, neutropenia, it was a small study randomized of just 21 patients, but they found that acupuncture was, real acupuncture was superior to sham for elevating uh, the white blood cell count. For radiation-induced xerostomia, um, Again, they're not, they're not the greatest studies. They're um, acupuncture versus education classes, and they switched the two groups. And 
did, did both to the two groups and found that those when they got acupuncture did better. That was for patients who were a long time out of radiation therapy and were living with chronic xerostomia. Another study um, looking at uh, acupuncture while patients are getting radiation therapy showed that those that got acupuncture were less likely to develop xerostomia. And I could go on and on sort of listing stuff here, um, but basically um, for breast cancer patients on tamoxifen, um, acupuncture has been shown to be superior to sham in hot flashes. Um, same with the study below. In the middle of breast cancer patients on anti-hormone uh, treatment, there was a study looking at 94 patients and found that real was much better than sham and no treatment, sham being slightly better than no treatment. Prostate cancer, and, and yeah, so there's a bunch of studies on this and uh, various quality, even the randomized controls studies. Um, some are inconclusive, some are favorable. Prostate cancer, again, not much out there except for we took 10 or 15 patients and gave them acupuncture and they felt better with no control groups. For dyspnea, uh, Cochrane looked mostly at COPD patients and found that maybe there's a little evidence for it. Uh, that was in 2009. One of the better studies was published last year with COPD patients and found that acupuncture was actually fairly helpful for shortness of breath and exercise tolerance. And uh, for post-operative issues, post-operative symptom management, um, nausea and vomiting, um, acupuncture is supported by Cochrane and recommended by the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists. For post-operative pain, uh, that hasn't been assessed by uh, Cochrane, but uh, large meta-analysis is supportive. And for pre- and post-op anxiety, acupuncture is shown to be somewhat effective. So with acupuncture and headache, the Cochrane Systemic Review did show that acupuncture is effective for tension-type headache and migraine prophylaxis for headache frequency and pain intensity. I don't think it works as well for acute migraine. Um, there have been some trials, but it's been equivocal there. In two cost-effectiveness trials in Germany and the UK, acupuncture was found to be cost-effective for headaches when implemented into a primary care network. I'd like now to discuss acupuncture for other conditions which might come into an outpatient primary care office and patients might come in with an assortment of, of ailments and they might say, well, you know, doc, does acupuncture work for this? And this is what I'd like to go over here. We'll go over the points in yellow a little more detail. Um, the other ones I'll just say for autism, the Cochrane analysis did not show that acupuncture worked for autism. That's not surprising, but for BPH, um, it did not change PSA or prostate volume, but it did improve lower urinary tract symptoms. Been sh it has also been shown to work specific points in the foot for plantar fasciitis versus placebo. Um, for peripheral joint arthritis, acupuncture did not show to be did not prove to be effective in a co Cochrane analysis for, for instance, small joint arthritis of the hand. <clears throat> Same for rheumatoid arthritis. Interestingly, for ringing of the ears, um, acupuncture seemed to be a benefit in a meta-analysis, but I think that is also a little bit controversial. And another interesting thing which I find really fascinating is that for medically unexplained symptoms, so after a Western diagnosis has been attempted but, but has not been successful in I, I diagnosing someone, a UK study actually showed that for medically unexplained symptoms, acupuncture was helpful. So acupuncture or opioid addiction. Um, 10 randomized controlled trials of over 1,000 patients. Um, ear acupuncture or auricular acupuncture did not show, seem to have clinical gains from acupuncture for heroin addiction treatment. However, five out of five of the RCTs using body acupuncture did report effectiveness. <clears throat> the conclusion was that more studies are needed. Acupuncture for addiction for smoking or for smoking cessation, the Cochrane Review in 2006 showed that there was no consistent evidence that acupuncture is effective for smoking cessation. Some of the trials were positive and some were negative, and some did not show any difference uh, between sham. In fact, in 2008, um, analysis showed that body acupuncture was not more effective than sham acupuncture, acupuncture, but both groups did decrease the 
Minnesota nicotine withdrawal scale score by over 60%, which is better than medication. So again, more studies are needed, high quality studies. Acupuncture is commonly used in traditional Chinese medicine for allergic rhinitis. And there was, uh, in a meta analysis, a positive trend towards symptom relief for allergic rhinitis, but clinical trial quality was considered inadequate. Um, it can be in both distal places as well as in the, in the um, near the maxillary sinuses. But again, I think for all these um, studies, the, the broader question is, you know, for each study, it might be a, a different point. And uh, in fact, as Steve was mentioning, when a practitioner does evaluate a patient, they may change the point at the time of the visit. So in um, 2001, there was a international committee of doctors, acupuncturists, and researchers that came together and uh, formed what was called the Standards for Acupuncture Reporting and Trials, and they came up with five or six criteria for how to report acupuncture trials. So since, since that point, there's been an update of that in 2010, and they, they've actually shown that in 2007, up to 50% of trials were meeting all of those criteria. So I think the, the trials are getting you know, more, um, more high quality. So that's a good question. Acupuncture for asthma, um, again, the trial reporting was uh, poor and the trial quality was deemed inadequate to generalize findings. Um, it, it did not show a difference between sham acupuncture and true acupuncture there, but one of the criticisms of this review was that points in the sham arm of some studies are used for treatment of asthma according to traditional Chinese medicine. Acupuncture for anxiety does have more of evidence. The overall positive findings were the strongest evidence for ear acupuncture in the perioperative period, specifically before surgery. Acupuncture for depression. Um, there were similar benefits between acupuncture, sham acupuncture, and control treatments, which, inc which included SSRI, fluoxetine, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. Two of the studies done in China did show that acupuncture uh, plus an SSRI was, was better than an SSRI alone. Acupuncture for primary dysmenorrhea showed improvement in pain relief and menstrual symptoms from acupuncture compared to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and Chinese herbs. Acupuncture for fibromyalgia. Um, there is strong evidence for reduction of pain post-treatment, and I have had success with this as well, but there is no evidence for reduction of fatigue or sleep disturbances or improvement of physical function in fibromyalgia based on Cochrane and now, uh, based on a systemic review, excuse me. Um, the Cochrane review is in protocol now. 2012 review in um, Cochrane, um, systemic review done um, in Hong Kong showed that acupuncture for insomnia, um, current evidence was not su sufficiently rigorous to either support or refute acupuncture for insomnia. Um, interestingly enough, acupressure, which is basically acupuncture without the needles, was helpful and did result in people getting improvement in their, in their sleep quality. A study done here uh, locally um, at the University of Maryland Center for Integrative Medicine and published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology did show that a subgroup of sham controlled randomized controlled trials found that acupuncture was beneficial for IBS, but so was a sham group. Um, both of these uh, sham and ac acupuncture as well as probiotics and psychotherapy were all better than pharmacologic therapy, which is generally antispasmodic therapy or no treatment at all. So this is an interesting finding. Acupuncture for obesity. So some people actually come for weight loss and, you know, can acupuncture help weight loss? And I think the findings are a little surprising here. Um, acupuncture did show improved outcomes for weight compared to lifestyle, sham, and conventional medications, about um, 1.7 kilos different, kilograms different here. Um, however, this systemic review showed that um, about two-thirds of the trials were of poor methodologic quality, and there needs to be better quality trials. This was in 2009. A study uh, done in 2012, which was considered high quality, uh, did show that um, acupuncture for a total of 12 treatments, so this was uh, twice a week f uh, for six weeks between real and sham electroacupuncture, 20 minutes per treatment on patients who were overweight or obese but did not, did not have diabetes, hypertension, or coronary artery disease, and both were also on a low-calorie diet. Um, but there was a significant difference in the um, weight reduction of three 
three kilograms between the real and the sham treatment at, at 12 week follow up. So just to summarize, uh, indications for acupuncture, recommendations that are generally accepted by insurances that do take uh, coverage for acupuncture and for which there is high quality evidence include for nausea and vomiting, for certain types of pain which include chronic low back pain, neck pain, knee osteoarthritis, headache and post-operative pain. And for other clinical conditions with less established or evolving evidence, acupuncture can be employed as part of an integrated treatment plan along with other treatment modalities. So in conclusion, acupuncture is the most common oldest medical procedure in the world. It is not a replacement for a medical diagnosis and treatment, but can be a valuable addition to an integrative treatment plan. It is very safe, which I think is an important uh, consideration when considering any therapy, and effective for a variety of clinical conditions when practiced by qualified practitioners. High quality trials are ongoing, and I believe that the quality of trials is improving in the last 10 years, and there should be more evidence as to how acupuncture affects certain clinical conditions. And um, we wish to thank you for, for listening and coming. Um, I'll let, yeah. I think that, okay, so the, the question was for acupuncture for integrative medicine for colds and for cancer. Yes, um, studies done in Japan to prevent colds have shown a benefit, and so they get less colds and flu. So the typical treatment uh, time for acupuncture would be in the fall, right before flu season would hit. Um, for acupuncture and cancer, maybe Steve has more on this, but I know for um, study, studies on natural killer cells, um, there has been shown an increase in NK cell activity with acupuncture. Yeah, th there's not any studies for cancer prevention, and I think it would be um, wise to advise patients that it can be used as an adjunctive for cancer treatment, but for, certainly not for, you know, definitively for cancer prevention. There's no evidence for that. Um, I think that one thing about Chinese acupuncture, and when you look at the studies in Asia, some of the Chinese studies do acupuncture every day. In China, acupuncture is a covered entity. So in some of the trials on depression, they would do it for 30 days, but they would get it every day. So they might get 20 to 30 treatments. That's a difference. Um, in terms of the environment, there is some, um, a lot more integration in China, I believe, with acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, so there might be dietary therapies, exercises like Qigong or Tai Chi. A lot of people get up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. every day and do Tai Chi, and that also moves the Qi or the life energy, and that could be an adjunct to acupuncture. And in fact, acupuncture is felt to be, by traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, a secondary therapy, and you try exercises first, just like we might do here with physical therapy and exercise, and you try non-invasive things first before you go to a procedure. In China, Western, so I think the question is, how does acupuncture interact with the system of, China, of medicine in China? Um, in China, if you're a medical student, you have, well, in China, if you're, a, if you're an undergraduate, I believe you have the option of going to a traditional Chinese medicine school or a Western school, but even the Western schools are integrated, so they'll learn about acupuncture. And if you're a patient and you go into a system of, um, if you go into the medical system in China, like in Beijing, you have the option of choosing between Eastern and Western medicine and they'll often consult with each other. So I think there is a lot more acceptance of traditional Chinese medicine uh, there than there was like 
say 20 to 30 years ago when it was actually actively suppressed by the, um, by the communists. Was uh, in summary, does occupation help acupuncture help for diabetic neuropathy? Um, the the only reasonably well done study I'm familiar with is uh, acupuncture for neuropathic pain in uh, cancer patients, um, where it was shown to be better than than uh, so. Um, I think there there are small studies that you know are case reports and things like that 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 shows some uh, support uh, for something like that. But, you know, not, there isn't robust data unless, Andy, you have something to say. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Steve. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend for diabetic peripheral neuropathy acupuncture as a first-line treatment. It might be an adjunctive, but I believe the studies that have been done on that have not shown it to be of, of conclusive benefit. I believe there are, but I, I want to say I don't know the literature on that, so I, I can't I can't comment on that. Um, I, yes, I know, you know that. Okay. Well, I, the answer is yes, but what is it shown? I don't know. Um, Ted Kapchik at Harvard does a lot of placebo studies, and, and he's a trained acupuncturist, and, and I'll, I'll have to look at that and get back to you on that. But, but I mean, placebo is, and, and the psycho-emotional aspects of acupuncture treatment are certainly strong, and I think you, you can't be discounted. I think most, um, most trials are done describing the skill of the acupuncturist and how much experience they have, but often you might get um, a trial of, say, a typical trial, a small trial would be 100 to 200 patients, and they'll have two acupuncturists, but they would both have pretty good skill. So most of the trials are done with, you know, people of, with a, a good amount of skill. I, I don't think there's, there's trials comparing um, directly acupuncture, you know, I, training. Actually, I have a that yeah, because okay. uh, I did come across one study actually looking at that, and I was it was interesting study. I, I can't remember the details in it, but it was a great study. It's worth looking back on. But but basically the answer was no. That there was no difference between a, a junior doing it for a really long time. The, the other study. The, the other comment I'd say about that is that physician acupuncturists, you know, get get training that's different than licensed acupuncturists. So in the study in Germany where they studied 13,000 physicians and they treated 2.2 million patients for, you know, for treatments that would be also seen by a licensed acupuncturist, the physicians would get, you know, 300 hours of training. I mean, that was their maximum training, uh, uh, you know, or minimum training rather. So, so I think um, versus a physician that's been out or an acupuncturist that's been out for 10 years or 20 years, I mean, they, they all got pretty good results, and I think as a result of those studies in Germany, the insurance companies decided to pick up coverage of acupuncture treatment for chronic pain and for headache. That, that depends on the patient. I think that um, certainly patients that are anxious about the needles, talking to patients is very helpful, or playing some music, or having a nurse or a medical assistant come in and check in on the patient. Some patients like it to be quiet, and there's certain treatments that require uh, uh, quietness for the protocol as well. So it really depends on the patient. Typically, it would be 15 to 20 minutes. Um, 30 minutes, I think, would be the max, and um, I think it's longer when it's an acute pain and you're trying to kind of draw out the inflammation as opposed to something more chronic.
<laughs> I can answer that. <laughs> when will, uh, how do we get an acupuncturist to a patient? Um, I'm happy to say I was certified to do it in the hospital yesterday. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'll be available for that. Uh, the outpatient setting is a little more complicated. Um, I don't know if you want to comment I, I, about um, that. Anyway. I practice primary care in an outpatient setting as well as medical acupuncture. And, you know, um, so I'll be happy to see anyone, you know, for, for outpatient or, or to discuss things over the phone and, you know, if something is, someone is appropriate. Sure, sure. I think, you know, reading all these studies for this presentation, I mean, I was always kind of cross-referencing to, you know, does this actually work in clinical practice and what has been my experience. I think for low back pain, for um, knee osteoarthritis, for neck pain, and for tension headache, it has been very effective for my patients. And pa I've had patients half the dose of their medication to get off some of their medication, you know, been able to go on holidays with their family that they wouldn't have been before, you know, because of acupuncture treatment for pain conditions. I think for other things for which there's not as much evidence, it's kind of hit and miss, and it's unpredictable to know what the response will be. Something like infertility, for instance, which is a common one. There's not any clinical evidence based on the Cochrane reviews that, that it's actually something that works, but it probably works for some people, and it may work by increasing levels of serotonin or beta endorphins, you know, reducing levels of stress and, and depression and things like that, and that, that, that can bring the body back into balance and allow someone to, to heal themselves. And I think that's a key point in acupuncture, just like any tr medical treatment. We want to not treat the disease, but treat the patient, and that's something that is really critical when evaluating a patient and deciding whether or not they, they're appropriate for acupuncture. But I do find that it has been very clini uh, clinically useful as another tool in my toolkit to help patients. Thank you very much. Congratulations, I didn't know it was yesterday, but.